Give me the mic. Can you hear me okay? All right. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. It's nice to be here to tell you a little bit about the quark gluon plasma and what we're doing in the STAR experiment to probe it. <laughs> so before I get started, I want to introduce my group members. Um, Nihar, Derek, and Yanfang, all hardworking people. Um, Nihar is a postdoc, and the graduate students are both in their starting their third year. Uh, also working on stars, Bob said, are Carl and Bob, and Zilong, who is just about to graduate. All right, so this is my outline. <coughs> I'm going to start by telling you <coughs> what the physics were after, why collide heavy ions at such high energy. Then what is our experiment? How are we trying to... Um, get to those physics goals with that experiment. Some general features of the matter we're creating, and then more about uh, how we probe the matter. And this is where my interest is, hard probes, what <coughs> our group works on. So for example, high momentum scattered partons end up as jets. So that's one probe of the matter. And heavy quarkonium, which is a large quark-antiquark uh, large mass quark antiquark pair, like charmonium or bottomonium. <coughs> then I will conclude <coughs> and some open questions and mention what is the future of our field. Apologize for my cold. <coughs> okay, so what is our goal? Um, we are interested in learning more about the strong force, which is described by the theory of quantum chromodynamics, QCD. Some interesting features of this um, theory is confinement. This manifests itself in the fact that we don't see free quarks. Quarks are confined in um, color neutral objects, such as baryons and mesons. Uh, we can write the quark antiquark potential as a term which is a Coulomb term, which dominates at small distances. This pointer is not really working. You see it? Not really. Oh, that would be nice. <laughs> and then a confining term, which is a linear term and has this string tension um, parameter, which prevents the quarks from being free. So, this <laughs> confining term. Another interesting property of QCD is the generation of mass. So while uh, free quark mass comes from the Higgs mechanism, it's only about 5 or 7 MeV, most of the hadronic mass comes from the non-perturbative nature of the QCD vacuum. So <coughs> the existence of quark condensates and gluon condensates in the vacuum, these quarks get dressed by their interactions with these condensates. And finally, asymptotic freedom which is the property that the interaction becomes weaker with, at higher energies or smaller distances. So while these are both very non-perturbative features and difficult to calculate, only can be calculated numerically on a lattice, asymptotic freedom does allow for some calculations at high energies because the coupling becomes um, smaller there. <laughs> Here you can see the coupling as a function of um, momentum transfer. This is a plot of alpha s, it's a function of q, momentum transfer. And you can see that it decreases with increasing energy. And included on here is data from everything from uh, deep and elastic scattering and E plus E minus annihilation. In 1973, um, the asymptotic was, uh, freedom was discovered in the context of QCD by these folks here, leading to a Nobel Prize. And this led a lot of people at that time to start thinking about uh, what does that mean for dense systems? Are, could there be a, a quark-gluon plasma, a phase of deconfined quarks and gluons in a very dense uh, system such as a quark star or a neutron star? <coughs> And in 1974, there was a workshop, which was a seminal in our field, 
where some of our um, nuclear physics colleagues still around today met and discussed um, colliding heavy ions to actually create a quark gluon plasma. The workshop was called on GEV per nucleon collisions on heavy ions, how and why. So why heavy ions? Well, a proton-proton collision can also create large energy densities. It's much smaller, and a, a heavy ion collision provides opportunity for rescattering, heating of the system, <coughs> and together with the compression, that provides um, favorable conditions for deconfined matter. So this is a diagram, phase diagram of QCD matter, <coughs> where the y-axis is temperature and the x-axis is baryon chemical potential, which is related to the net baryon density in the matter. So what you can see here is what we think is where the hadron gas is and where we have a transition to a deconfined matter, quark gluon plasma, on the other side of this curve. <coughs> At different energies, collision energies, you probe different parts of this uh, phase diagram. The higher in energy you go, the lower baryon chemical potential. So at RIC, we think we're here in this region, at low baryon chemical potential, LHC even more so. And <coughs> lattice calculations can provide us with a critical temperature. But lattice calculations are only reliable at zero baryon chemical potential. They have provided us at that point, it's about 170 MeV, the transition from hadronic to deconfined matter with an energy density of 0.7 GeV per cubic Fermi. And this calculation here shows <coughs> quantities that are ratios of thermodynamic quantities that are proportional to the number of degrees of freedom. And so you can see a rise in the degrees of freedom here from um, free pion gas to a quark gluon plasma. And the fact that it levels off like this, rather than exploding like a hadron resonance gas, is also uh, indicative of this uh, phase, <coughs> new phase. Also shown here is the limit for a Stefan Boltzmann gas. So uh, up here, this would be a weakly interacting gas. <coughs> so where do we do this research? We do it at the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider, which is at Brookhaven National Lab in New York, Long Island. There we collide gold on gold. And the highest energy we uh, have there available is 200 GeV per nucleon. And the first run was in 2000. At the LHC, most of you think of it as a high energy particle experiment, but there also is a heavy ion program. Uh, the first heavy ions were collided in 2010, and they collide lead on lead, the highest energy at 5 TeV. So as my <coughs> title says, we here at TAMU work at the STAR experiment, solenoidal tracker at RIC. <coughs> and the main components of the detector that I want to point out are the TPC, the time projection chamber, which together with the magnet, provides full azimuthal coverage for tracking. Then we also have a barrel electromagnetic calorimeter with that full azimuthal coverage, which provides us a neutral energy measurement for electromagnetic interactions. <coughs> this is a picture of the tracks after they come out of a collision. So this is the time projection chamber. The beams come in this direction, so interaction point somewhere there. And you can see thousands of tracks in our detector. This is a TPC. <coughs> so the challenge for us is to make some, um, understand what these remnants, how that relates back to the quark gluon plasma that was created. So how does the, <coughs> the collision evolve? Initially, you have the two nuclei approaching each other. Lorentz contracted at very high energies. And so here you just have initial state effects. And we start to have hard collisions, a large amount of energy transfer, stopping. And you start to build up pressure from all of the rescattering. The hard probes are created early. Then as the matter expands, you, you have a hydrodynamic-like 
expansion of the, the matter, which then cools and finally freezes out. And these particles then go into our detectors. <laughs> and the, the reason I point out the hard probes is because they then live through this entire medium evolution and serve as probes of the medium that follows. <coughs> So there are two ways of really looking at these collisions, bulk observables versus hard probes. The bulk observables are the particles at low momentum. So hadrons at low momentum, about low 1 or 2 GeV, produced in the thermal medium uh, to give us general features of the matter created. Hard probes are those created early. They had to have a large momentum transfer. And so we end up with a high momentum track that we can look at. So we typically look for hard probes with high PT or high mass. And um, <coughs> again, these serve as probes of the, the bulk medium. So these are two different approaches of uh, trying to understand the matter. They're complementary. They tell us different things, the bulk observables versus the hard probes. <clears throat> but as experimentalists, the first thing we have to do is characterize our collisions, figure out what the different types of collisions are. So when you have beam on beam, you can have the gold-gold collisions at any kind of impact parameter. So here, from zero impact parameter, head-on collision, where um, it's center on center, and all of the nucleons are participating, to a large impact parameter, which is a grazing collision, where not much of a medium is formed. From a geometric model, of, um, we can calculate the average number of binary nucleon-nucleon collisions that would occur in such a collision versus any other centrality class, <coughs> and the number of participants. But of course, the impact parameter isn't something that we measure in the detector. What we measure are things that might be correlated to it. For instance, the transverse energy is correlated to impact parameter or the multiplicity, the number of particles in the detectors. So we can classify our events by these quantities that we observe in our detectors. And then for a given class, we have approximate uh, geometrical quantities, like the number of binary collisions for those that class of events, or the number of participants. <coughs> so shown here is from the Alice experiment, <coughs> spectrum spectra as a function of transverse momentum. So this is basically the number of particles as a function of the transverse momentum on a log scale. And this, what separates soft physics from hard physics, the soft probes are here at low momentum, and the hard probes are at high momentum. And you can see that um, they're orders of magnitude down when you get to the hard probes. So these are very rare particles, where mo while most of the particles are soft. You can see this, this centrality that I was referring to, that you go from the most central, which has the most particles, to the most peripheral, 70 to 80 percent, which has the least, closer to our proton-proton reference. <coughs> the other thing to point out about soft versus hard is you can see a change in the shape of the spectra, characteristic of uh, hard physics. Here you have this power law behavior telling us there's a difference in the physics mechanism that produces these particles versus these. Okay? All right, so the bulk observable that I want to talk about. I want to talk about one bulk observable before I get to hard probes, because this we really learned a lot about the matter that we created from this. So this relies on the fact that not all um, the heavy iron collisions are head-on. So in this case, we're looking at the front view, one, one nucleon, nucle nuclei go one nucleus going into the board, one coming out. And then there's this overlap region, which is the interacting matter. And you can see there's a uh, spatial anisotropy, sort of like a football shape. <coughs> so in that region, you have reinteractions. Pressure builds up. And the pressure gradients will be larger on the short axis than the long axis. And that pressure will push higher momentum particles farther in this direction and then in this direction. For this to be visible in our detectors, that means that the pressure has to effectively be able to transfer this initial spatial anisotropy to a final state momentum anisotropy before this um, dissipates. 
because as it expands, the anisotropy is dissipating. So to see if this, we see this, we can look at the particles in our detector as a function of azimuthal angle with respect to the reaction plane. So we look at the distribution in angle of the particles, and then the second Fourier co coefficient gives us the degree to which there is this anisotropy in the final state. And in the early days of RIC, we saw this from central to more peripheral. Central, again, there is no anisotropy. And you can see that there's a cosine-like behavior as you go more and more um, to the uh, peripheral. This is in plane at 0 and pi minus pi. And so there are more particles here than out of plane at pi over 2. <coughs> we fit these distributions and extract the V2, the second Fourier coefficient, to quantify the degree of anisotropy. And that's plotted here as a function of centrality. So these are the data points. And shown uh, to co as a comparison is ideal hydro. And ideal hydro works very well which was a surprise because we didn't think that the pressure would so effectively uh, transfer the anisotropy to the final state. What that means is that the thermalization must occur on a very small time scale before the dissipation. <coughs> the hydro? Yeah. And the interactions must be very strong so that this doesn't dissipate. So more recent calculations include viscosity in their calculations and compared to data. So in this calculation, you see that the, um, this viscosity to entropy density is varied. And then the best value is found that compares to the data. And what we see is that it's somewhere between 1 and 2 over 4 pi. But the, Ex the experimental and theoretical uncertainties are large. But it's small, we can say that. <laughs> so how small <coughs> is it? If we compare it to, for instance, other liquids, you can see here that this, in these units of 1 over 4 pi, for helium, nitrogen, and water with their minima at the critical temperature, and you can see a line here. What is the line? The line comes to us from a string theory, which has a duality with a uh, conformal field theory, which has some similarities to QCD. So it's a strongly interacting theory. So it gives us sort of an idea of what might be the strong, uh, strongly interacting bound. And they conjecture that the lower bound on this is 1 over 4 pi. <laughs> and at RIC, we're seeing somewhere between that and 2 with uncertainties, maybe, say, two or three. So here, if on this plot, it's plotted as a function of T minus T naught at the phase transition. And these other liquids, and we see that Rick has the lowest viscosity to entropy density of any known substance. So we know that we have a very strongly coupled uh, system that we have from the bulk properties. So again, we have lots of different observables. What I've shown you now is from the bulk properties that the collective expansion described by Hydro tells us early thermalization and strong coupling. Then we have um, jets, which are partons that are scattered early in the collision and then um, experience the medium and probe um, so things such as density. Electromagnetic probes, such as dileptons and photons, are often called penetrating probes because electromagnetic probes don't interact strongly. So they penetrate through the, the medium. And they give us information such as the mass generation, chiral symmetry restoration. And photons give us information about the QGP temperature. But I won't talk about these. I'll talk about the jets and heavy quarkonium, such as charmonium and bottomonium, and they have a direct connection to deconfinement. So that's why that's interesting. So we are, again, trying to create deconfined matter. So having a direct signature that we have deconfinement is something we're after. So these are the two that I'll be talking about. So first, on hard scattered partons. What does that mean? Hard scattering means there's a large momentum transfer. And so if you have a large momentum transfer that's a short distance, 
So the partons can be resolved. So the, the interaction is a, on the level of parton-parton scattering. And then as the partons scatter, because of, uh, whoops, how do I get that? Yeah, but, oh, here's my mouse. OK, sorry. Um, because of confinement, the, the parton then fragments into a cone of hadrons that is collimated and has this uh, correlation. And then the other one, back to back, momentum conservation, you have a jet on the other side. So we have dye jets, and these are, this is a proton-proton collision, but then if they're created early in a heavy ion collision, then they have to go through the medium, and any modifications in the medium tells us about their interactions with the medium <coughs> and some properties. So that's what we're after. But jets in gold-gold collisions are difficult. This is an extreme case to show you. Here's a nice, clean proton-proton event where you can see the dye jet in the star experiment. And this is now a... Um, a side view, a uh, front view of, front cross-sectional view of the TPC. And here you have a central gold-gold collision with thousands of tracks and maybe some jets. Who knows, right? So how do we measure jets? One thing we can do is we can look at just the high PT particles. Because if you look at a high PT particle, it's likely a leading particle of a jet. So we can look at how they are affected. We can also look at correlations because, as I said, the jet is a cone of hadrons back to back, right? So we can look at how there are correlations between particles and find the jet signal that way. <coughs> or if we work really hard and fight the background, we can do full jet reconstruction, which we're trying now. So jet suppression was predicted early before Rick started running. So it was predicted that because of the medium, these jets that are produced would be suppressed. There would be fewer of them. And the way that we should see that is in a ratio. So if we look at the ratio of high PT particles in a gold-gold collision relative to a proton-proton collision, but scaled by the number of nucleon-nucleon collisions, <coughs> so the number of chances to, to have a hard collision, then if there is a suppression, then we expect that these particles at a given PT have energy loss, so they have less PT, and there's a shift. So at a given PT, we would see a suppression in the spectrum. On the other hand, if there were no effects, and you just have gold-gold um, being a superposition of nucleon-nucleon collisions, then this ratio would be 1, and you would just have R equals 1. So what did we see in the Phoenix experiment? This is this ratio as a function of PT, transverse momentum. And you can see the hadrons, in this case pi zeros and etas, are suppressed by a factor of 5. The photons, which don't interact strongly, scale by the number of binary collisions. So this told us that we had a huge effect from the medium, a suppression of a factor of 5. <coughs> And where we didn't expect the suppression, we, we didn't see one. <coughs> so what can we do with this? So recently, so a theoretical co uh, collaboration, or collaboration of theorists, called the JET Collaboration, got together with their different models of energy loss and tried to extract a transport coefficient. So the transport coefficient here is the PT broadening squared, basically, of the parton as it traverses the medium. And we have now data for both RIC and LHC, and these five models were put to the test by both data sets and try to extract with uh, a common coefficient, transport coefficient. So at the center for a 10 GeV parton, they found that the Q hat at RIC is 1.2, and then this dimensionless quantity, which is plotted here, is 4.6 q hat over t cubed. <coughs> At the LHC, it was found 1.9, and then dividing by the higher temperature, it's 3.7, so slightly smaller. Cold nuclear matter, on the other hand, was extracted from deep inelastic 
scattering experiments. And there the Q-hat is much smaller. Temperature is also smaller. So on this scale here of this dimensionless quantity, which is proportional to 1 over 8 over s, it's about an order of magnitude smaller. <coughs> so this is just a first step towards trying to extract the transport coefficient as a function of temperature. Now the other way that we can look at for jets is the correlations that I mentioned. So again, looking here at a star event in the TPC, the tracks, and then the calorimeter. These are the um, calorimeter towers. This is the longitudinal direction, so the pseudo rapidity. And then we find a trigger particle, which means we have a high momentum particle, and that is our trigger. We think there's a jet there. Then we look at all the particles uh, relative to that in azimuthal angle. And if there's a jet on the near side, there will be a signal at delta phi equals zero. And if there's a jet on the way side, there will be one at pi. And in fact, if you look at the delta phi distribution here for proton-proton, we have the near side jet, the away side jet, compared to um, gold-gold and peripheral collisions. And it agrees rather well. And then in central gold-gold collisions, you see the near side, and the away side is gone. <coughs> so there's a strong suppression of the away side jet, however, not the near side. That's because we have triggered on a high momentum particle on the near side. So we have biased ourselves to there being a jet, so likely surface biasing towards the part of the medium close to the surface, while the away side jet has to go through maximum medium, and then is suppressed, in this case, gone. So to quantify that as a function of centrality, so again, from peripheral collisions to head-on collisions, we look at the ratio of these yields of particles in these cones for a given momentum in gold-gold to proton-proton. And here you see the near side yield is approximately 1, not suppressed. And on the away side, you see the suppression that grows with centrality. <coughs> a nicer but more difficult trigger is if you have a photon trigger. Photons are difficult because there's a lot of background that you have to separate. But the photon is nice because if you have this sort of a scattering where you have a photon on one side and a jet on the other, the photon has no fragmentation, so it carries the full energy that would be expected on the other side. In addition, it also doesn't interact with the medium because it doesn't interact via the strong force. And so you have something that's a calibrated probe, and you can look on the other side to see what happened to the jet. Ideally, you would study this by reconstructing the full jet on the way side, not just a correlation. We haven't done that yet, but Nihar is working hard on that with Derek. Uh, but so far, worked on the photon-hadron correlations. And a result from the publication is shown here. <coughs> this is the ratio for photon-triggered jets uh, in gold-gold versus PP of the particles with, that are correlated in the away side jet as a function of the moment, transverse momentum of the constituents of the jet. You can see at IPT, you do have this suppression <coughs> But as you go to lower PT, there's less suppression. It's not really a surprise because the lost energy has to go somewhere. And if the, the particles that, uh, that come from the jet that have lost energy are somehow still collimated and still correlated to the jet, then they would just show up at lower momenta. Ideally, again, you would look at this in full, fully reconstructed jets to see the structure. Some more discussion of the interpretation of this. This is a model with two different conditions. In one condition, you follow the lost energy throughout the evolution of the shower. In the other case, it's just gone. And so you see that you have this huge enhancement at low PT if you follow the, the jet fragments, but it hasn't quite been seen in the data because it's difficult to go that low in PT. <laughs> we have seen some sign of it, though, in when we go to full jet reconstruction. So 
we want to do full jet reconstruction to see how the ener lost energy is redistributed and maybe to see when we probe different scales. When do we go from a uh, weakly coupled charge to strong interacting liquid? When does the, the, the parton that's traversing the medium see quasi-particles and when does it start seeing just the liquid? So some measurements of full energy, uh, full jet reconstruction from the LHC. Here's again this ratio showing the suppression as a function of PT. <coughs> and shown here are the hadron suppression and this is the full jet. There's not a lot of overlap because the full jets are hard to do and they start at high PT. But you do see that in the overlapping region it's very similar. So even though the jets go down to constituents of 200 MeV, we're not seeing the lost jet recovered in this plot, right? You would think if you got the full jet, you would see less suppression. You've recovered all of the energy. But in jet reconstruction, you have to choose a cone radius. And in heavy ions, it's very difficult. And you usually choose a small cone radius to minimize your background effects. So what this might be saying is that in addition to the lost energy going to lower PT fragments, it's going to a larger cone, that we have the transported to larger angles. <laughs> For example, in this picture, the parton interacting with the medium and some of the radiation interaction in the medium goes out of the cone that you're measuring. <coughs> One uh, attempt to start doing full jet reconstruction here at STAR is here's a trigger jet and then looking at the correlated hadrons. So one side is fully reconstructed, but then we look at the correlations uh, uh, around that jet. And shown here is an um, angular correlation function for proton-proton and gold-gold. And you do see for this momentum range, which is a pretty low momentum, that you see a huge broadening in the away side jet. So it does look like it's consistent with this picture of out-of-cone radiation. <coughs> also, we can see from this measurement that at high PT, you see the suppression, but at low PT, we see an enhancement. And this is about 2 GeV. So the lost energy is reappearing at PT less than 2. This is where the interesting physics is, because this is where we're not just getting jets shooting through the medium unaffected, but where it's actually interacting with the medium. And it can tell us something. This is where it's hard to measure low PT because we have so much background, but this is where the interesting physics is. OK, so in <coughs> parton energy loss, can full jets be recovered if we have a large enough cone radius? Another interesting question that I didn't address, but elastic versus radiative energy loss, which is being addressed with heavy quark um, suppression. And at what scale is the parton coupling to the medium become strong? So my last topic is heavy quarkonium, and we're starting to work on this. Jan Fang is looking into it. <coughs> so the idea here is that you have a bound state of a charm anti-charm pair. Then you have it inside of the quark gluon plasma. So you have all of these other color charges screening the uh, the binding of the the CC bar pair. And so the idea was that we should see a suppression of J psi, which is this state, in our heavy ion collision if we have a quark gluon plasma. And that would be due to deconfinement. So coming back to this um, effective potential that we mentioned at the beginning, lattice QCD calculations have shown that if you look at this as a function of um, temperature, that's what I want to say, sorry. Here's the zero temperature, um, which has the confinement. And then as you increase the temperature, you see a screening of this confinement term. So this is from the lattice. Well, do we see it in the data? So yes, here's the charmonium suppression seen at RIC. And again, this is one of these ratios to proton-proton expectation. And you can see with centrality, this ratio is decreasing. And we see more and more suppression of the J psi particle. 
However, what was surprising was that if you compare it with a, a factor of 10 smaller pollution energy from the SPS, the suppression is the same. And that smaller energy should have had a smaller energy density and therefore less suppression. So how do we understand that? That led to new theories of recombination of charm-anti-charm -charm pairs in a thermalized medium, producing, reproducing those uh, J size. <coughs> you also have cold nuclear matter effects, which are different at the two, so it's important to, ma to measure those. So what does happens at the LHC with those J size? LHC, again, is a factor of 10 larger in energy, so it should have larger energy density. It should have more suppression. But here we see, again, the RIC data and the LHC data. And the LHC data has less suppression, even. So even though it should have more suppression, it has more regeneration, because more CC bar pairs are created at higher energy. So there's more chances to recreate these uh, J size states. And you can see here that this was predicted by a former <coughs> so we want to look to upsilons for the signature of deep confinement. Upsilons are bottomoniums, so BB bar pairs. Those are heavier, and so there's fewer of them. There aren't enough of them to have a regeneration effect. And so if we look at this, uh, the binding energy of these three upsilon states, the 1s has a larger binding energy than the 2s and the 3s. So if we look at the ratios, of the 2s to 3s to the 1s, if there's melting in the plasma, these will melt first because they have lower binding energy. <coughs> and you can see the proton-proton ratio shown here as our baseline. And then we go to the star data, which at, the, at this point doesn't have all of the new statistics yet, an upper limit in the star, which shows that there is an effect that there's more melting of the 2s, 3s than the 1s. And then at the LHC, the 2s, 3s are almost gone compared to the 1s. So we've definitely seen um, quarconium, heavy quarconium suppression due to deconfinement. We've also seen that there is a regeneration of the J side. So what we need to do at this point is uh, disentangle the initial state effects, disentangle the regeneration for the suppression, uh, from the suppression in the J side. And then theoretically, what needs to be done is constrain the melting temperatures and ultimately deduce in medium effects on the QCD force. So on the star data point that had the large error bars, we have three recent runs where we've had a new uh, subdetector, muon telescope detector, with high statistics. So we'll be able to do this measurement with better precision. We'll be able to measure the upsilon goes to the muon decay channel and pin down those initial state effects. So proton gold gives us the cold nuclear matter or initial state effects. <coughs> so I finishing summary of what we've learned. We've learned that at RIC we have rapid thermalization of the medium. We have very low viscosity entry to be density ratio, lowest of any substance known. Large opacity to the hard scattered partons, very dense medium, large transport coefficient. And the theorists have started to, on a path to try to is extract these transport coefficients as a function of temperature, which will permit analysis of coupling strength. Jet medium interaction may give us a better uh, indication of the nature of the medium, quasi particles to liquid. And We've seen a signature of deconfinement. Heavy quarconium has, has, we've seen both suppression and regeneration. So for us at TAMU, what we're working on now, photon triggered full jet reconstruction to investigate whether we can look for that lost energy and measure the very low PT region where the interesting physics is. And heavy quarconium <coughs> in photon nucleus collisions to constrain the cold nuclear matter or initial state effect. Finally, what is the future of the field? Rick will run another six years to address the open questions. <coughs> and there's a beam energy scan to search for the critical point in the phase diagram. 
So here again is this phase diagram that I showed. It's temperature versus chemical potential. And the highest brick energy is here. But we had one beam energy scan already, 2010 to 2014 or so, starting to map out this region. And we have another beam energy scan planned to try to find the region where we go from it being a smooth crossover transition to a first order phase transition. There's, of course, the higher energy, LHC, which will run for another nine years or so. We have more at these lower energies. Bayer and Nika are planned to investigate again this uh, critical point. And then uh, for the future, there may be an electron ion collider to start to, uh, to investigate more of the initial state effects. Okay, so my postdoc actually did his thesis on this, but um, what you would see here is large fluctuations in um, conserved number quantities. So if you look at, for instance, um, number distributions, net baryons or so, and then you look at the, um, what do they call them, the higher moments. So not just mean and uh, width, but the higher moments. Then you expect that those are very sensitive to uh, these, uh, the critical point. I think you would just see because the, you have fluctuations in the susceptibilities that you would just see uh, some sort of jumping behavior if you look at, start to look at these quantities. This moment. <laughs> I think he was talking about the point. Yeah. Right? You were asking about the critical. <laughs> well, here you really can probe just the initial state without any of the other uh, effects. And so if you want to look at um, modifications to the parton distribution function as a function of x, if you have very large energies and you're probing lower and lower x, where the gluons are sort of uh, exploding and they must, the gluon density must saturate somewhere. And so we can start to look for that region where we have a saturation in the gluon density as a function of x. <laughs> Which? No, I think nobody knows that. And the LHC is at a higher energy, right? So going back to this, um, the lattice figure, yeah, somebody said that. Then here, Rick is somewhere at TC maybe two, two and a half, and LHC maybe three, three and a half, and there hasn't, we haven't seen it in a weekly interacting medium. <coughs> oh. oh, okay. <coughs> All of these PQCD models um, get the spectra, the IPT suppression for, for individual particles, so single particles, very well. They have different ways of approaching it, but they do get it, uh, describe it well. Some of the details, once you get to uh, full jets and um, correlations, are yet to be ironed out.
I was afraid you were going to ask that question. <laughs> the volume viscosity? <coughs> I don't know. No. I mean, it's just uh, very low viscosity. There isn't this, I mean, superfluid implies that you have some sort of condensate formed, right? So that's not what we're seeing. We're not seeing zero viscosity. We're seeing just lowest viscosity liquid. Right. No. I mean, at the point where we measure it, there's nothing about it that tells us when, uh, if it was reproduced or it was prompt. So it's just a matter of like comparing um, the heavier system, like the bottomonium, the JSI, the different binding energies. We can look at that, but the, just that particle, we wouldn't know. Not that I know of. Okay. Yeah, so um, I mentioned uh, momentum conservation, right? So you, you have them coming in, and then they scatter, and then you have, they're back to back. But there is some initial transverse momentum they have, so it's not exactly right. right. They have some broadening. <coughs> <coughs> 